Hello and welcome from the British Museum in London, where we're delighted that you're joining us from all over the world. I hope you're well settled in your seats and ready for your own private view of the exhibition of the summer, Life and Death in Pompeii and Herculaneum. As we take you through the exhibition, we'll be traveling to southern Italy close on 2,000 years ago. And with the help of a brilliant lineup of world-class experts, we'll meet the men and women who lived there and tell the terrible story of how they died in the cataclysmic volcanic eruption of Mount Vesuvius in AD 79. We're going to bring their world alive through the extraordinary objects that they left behind. And we'll come right up to date with the very latest discoveries and the work that is still going on that helps these people speak to us across the centuries. Welcome to Pompeii from the British Museum. Femini Doctissimi, ladies and gentlemen, I have great pleasure in declaring this wonderful exhibition open. Thank you very much. The British Museum's Life and Death in Pompeii and Herculaneum has been over five years in the making. It's involved an enormous amount of painstaking research, collaboration and planning and the movement of priceless and irreplaceable objects across Europe. The curator of the exhibition, Paul Roberts, who's with us tonight, has been at the centre of a huge team of experts from the British Museum. All focused on creating an unforgettable experience that we can now bring to you close up. Here we are in the, in the heart of the exhibition and we're with the director of the British Museum, Neil McGregor. Now, Neil, what sort of landmark is this for the museum? Well, thanks to the marvels of satellite transmission, it's a great landmark. What we wanted to do was to allow as many people as possible to come to visit this exhibition with these extraordinary objects. But to visit in a way that you can't normally, to visit it in the company of world experts, because it's experts that make things come to life. They make the objects speak. So we've got this wonderful lineup this evening of some of the greatest Roman scholars of the world, some of the friskiest Roman scholars of the world, including you, <laughs> Betty, to oh, take us round. Yeah, thank you so much. I have to say, yeah. I would not miss this for the world, because I think I'm right in saying, aren't I, that the British Museum's never actually hosted a Pompeii exhibition before. No, this is the first exhibition on Pompeii. But it's not just on Pompeii, it's also about Herculaneum the neighbour city, the slightly smaller city, but just as interesting and just as revealing. And the colleagues in the museums in Pompeii, Herculaneum and Naples have been so generous that we've been able to put together here a range of objects that have never been together before and we'll probably never see together again in our lifetime. OK, now what is the story, Neil, that you want this exhibition to tell people? I think we want to use these objects to let the visitor get close to a particular set of people at a particular moment. The moment, of course, is 79 AD. The Roman Empire is in full flower. Here in London, we've just joined the club, so to speak. In the last 30 years, we've become members of the Roman Empire. But in Pompeii and Herculaneum, it's different. By that date, for 100 years, Rome had controlled the whole Mediterranean. And the result was something that had never really existed before. This huge area of peace, stability, prosperity, trade. The people in Pompeii and Herculaneum have access to things from all over Europe. They are uniquely privileged, and that we can see. And to see how they used that and how they lived with all that, 
the best way, of course, is to visit people at home. So we've tried to construct the exhibition as though you were visiting a Pompeian at home. And we're sitting in the heart of the house, the atrium, where the public business of the house is conducted, a pool in the middle, open to the sky. And then off this public bit of the house, the private rooms. And we wanted to take you into the private bits, the bits that perhaps nowadays we wouldn't take our guests into, into the bedroom, to see what you do in the bedroom, what you fantasize about doing in the bedroom, the dining room, the kitchen, the drains, the daily life of somebody in Pompeii. And does it work, do you think? I mean, do you feel closer to these people? Do you have a sense of who they actually were? I find them both further away and much, much nearer. They're further away in the sense that that society of slavery is very remote to us. The religious structures, those gods that we read about, we can't really internalize. But these are people that take the pleasures very seriously. And they're the same pleasures as ours. It's food, wine, sex, partying, friends, family, and animals. This, I think, is a very good example. This mosaic would have been just inside the door of the house. And it's a wonderful dog, obviously a very uh, dog that's much loved. Um, she's got a very expensive collar and a smart red lead, eyes um, twinkling, ears pricked up, tail wagging as she bounds towards you. It's the sort of dog, when you visit the house of friends, you know the dog, the dog knows you, and it comes to meet you. And you feel immediately close to the animal and the people that owned it. And, of course, there's another famous mosaic of a dog from Pompeii, the famous Cave Canem, Beware the Dog, the Roman equivalent of a pit bull um, at the door to tell you to keep out. And I think, in a way, almost the animals at the entrance make us feel particularly close. As you come into the exhibition, there's a third dog. It's the cast of a real dog that died tethered by a chain, convulsed as the ash, the heat, and the debris of the eruption overwhelmed it. And that is a wonderfully powerful uh, effect. You know that these are real living beings confronting an unimaginable catastrophe. Yes, I must say, you know, I think those dogs say it all in their different ways. I mean, what, what was a tragedy for those people 2,000 years ago is, is for us a spectacular revelation about what life was like then. So let's look now at what actually happened on that extraordinary day in AD 79. In the space of about 12 hours, Pompeii and Herculaneum Two small Roman cities just south of Naples were buried by the eruption of Mount Vesuvius, a volcano that loomed over them. Herculaneum was a quiet seaside place just west of Vesuvius, and Pompeii a larger civic center some miles to the southeast. Vesuvius erupted in the early afternoon and fired volcanic ash up to 30 kilometers, around 20 miles, into the Italian sky. The mushroom cloud of ash then collapsed and poured down on the surrounding towns and villages. Over a thousand people, their homes and possessions, lay buried for over 1,500 years. The cities continue to yield astonishing treasures 2,000 years later, and we're still finding out about the lives of these particular Romans. We're going to follow the people of Pompeii and Herculaneum through their last two days. We begin with the last afternoon before the disaster. It's the end of the working day. The streets are bustling with people going to the theater, calling in at a bar, shopping at the market or gathering in the forum. And of course, many slaves are still hard at work catering for this busy population. Well, now, before we look in detail at what people were getting up to in Pompeii and Herculaneum, that afternoon and early evening. Mary, you know just about, more than anyone else does about this, well, you do, you know, about Pompeii and Herculaneum, how people lived in those days. How did these two cities figure in the Roman Empire? Well, I think when you come to this show, you see these fantastic wow objects. I mean, 
you know, beautiful paintings, glass, silver, and it's terribly easy to get a kind of extravagant image Jelly of Pom Pompeii and Herculaneum. I mean, look over here, there's yeah. amazing stuff on this table. But, you know, I could really love this blue bowl. It's gorgeous, isn't, isn't it? it? Absolutely wonderful. Absolutely And there's a silver goblet down Absolutely there that's cool. sensational. But in a way... But that's sumptuous, that's very rich. We mustn't get carried away by this, because Actually, the truth is that Pompeii and Herculaneum were absolutely ordinary, one-horse towns in southern Italy. And, OK, they had some rich people living in them, but, frankly, if they hadn't been destroyed by Vesuvius and then excavated again, we'd never have heard of them. And most Romans living in Rome wouldn't have heard of them. They're very, very ordinary, and in a way, that's why they're quite interesting to us, simply because they are so normal. When I look at a painting like this, uh, you know, one of the things I think is, so where did all the colour come from? Uh -huh. Now, actually, what they've got here, this is <laughs> something really extraordinary. These two rather uh, sort of unappealing lumps of white. Not exactly colour, is it? But uh, no. It's but what is that? Well, they're lumps of the dry pigment, both of them making white paint, uh, that you'd mix with water to put on the walls. Now, those are probably made locally, and, and quite a lot of the pigments they've got for these paintings come from the local area, but some of them come from... The Empire, they come from Spain, they come from Africa. So there's a kind of way in which you know, Pompeii and Herculaneum, little one-horse towns that they are, they have the product of empire on their walls. And of course, the guys are eating the product of empire. I mean, you know, the things that really spiced up Pompeian diet you know, were things like pepper. You know, where does that come from? It comes from the East. So Can tell us something now about the people who lived here, what kind of society was it? How like ours was it? Well, in some ways it's very like ours and in some ways it is completely different. And I, mean, I think the bottom line in trying to understand these cultures is slavery. Look at that gorgeous goblet. And you know, how do we imagine it? We imagine the owner drinking out of it. And we sort of imagine ourselves as the rich Pompeians drinking out of it. It's a lovely fantasy. I think it's quite, always quite useful to say, okay, so who cleaned it? Who polished it? Who washed it up? Uh, you know, who put it in the cupboard and checked that no one had nicked it? Um, these objects are all, in some ways, slave objects. And that is an inequality that, that we find, I think, very hard to, to sort of internalise. And women? Um, before we end this on quite such a bleak note about slaves, I mean, I think the thing was about slaves is that it was an unequal but a very mobile society. And what is uh, very striking about Rome and Pompeii and Herculaneum is that slave owners freed lots of slaves. And freed slaves became Roman citizens. There's a guy you see, when you come into this show, just before you get to, to the entrance, there is a fantastic bronze statue. And you look at him and you think, there's a Roman toff for you. You're telling me it's an amazing yeah. statue. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Is he an emperor? No. Well, we know who he is, because there was an inscription found underneath him, and he's an ex-slave who's made it big in the local community. And uh, the inscription says they put this up to him having had a public whip round. So, you know, slaves uh, often turn into ex-slaves and they have a considerable degree of status. And there's lots of them. I mean, one recent estimate, and it's based on a bit of a citizenship list from Herculaneum that's in the show, uh, one recent estimate is that maybe 50% of the population of, Hercu of the citizen population of Herculaneum were ex-slaves. OK, so much for slaves. Now, what Worse about for women? women. You, 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 you talk about it being a very mobile society. Yeah. What about women? What was their place in society? What rights did they have? Well, formally, very few. Um, they had no vote, they had no formal political rights. There's something quite paradoxical about Roman women, and you see it uh, immediately you come up the stairs into the show with the statue of a woman from Pompeii called Eumachia. Mm -hmm. And what she reminds us of is that they might have no formal political rights, but 
they could be rich, and they seem to have had quite a, a large degree of independent control over their wealth. And the Umakia, who greets us at the top of the stairs, uh, next to the Empress Livia, a uh, lovely pair, um, she actually endowed one of the big buildings that uh, flanks the Forum uh, in Pompeii. Mm -hmm. and I think that's okay, the... so some women can succeed. What about most of them, though? What's their position in the household? They've got, they, think, right, they've got slaves to look after. I think, all the well, we, yeah. <laughs> the rich ones have got all the slaves. Uh, I think poor, poor women are working as, you know, flower sellers, as bartenders. Um, many of them will be themselves ex-slaves. You know, just think about the sex workers in the Pompeian brothel. So women are doing all kinds of all kinds of different jobs, often at the bottom of the social strata. OK, back to our timeline. What are they doing now, all these people, at this time of the afternoon, the early evening? What's going on? Well, it depends where on the social spectrum you were. I mean, if you were relatively humble, uh, living in, you know, a... a you know, a one-bedroom flat, basically. Um, you might not have a kitchen. Uh, and I think the men, at least, would be um, out at the cafe, at the bar. There's a good bar cafe well, culture look in Pompeii, we can, we can which we can see. Yeah. I'm afraid there's no drink for us, but there's <laughs> great pictures of drinking. And I'm going to nip naughtily behind the barrier. This is almost my favourite piece in the whole exhibition. It's from a bar, and what it shows is life, the kind of life you had in the bar. Um, starting off here, that's pretty obvious, a couple having a snog. Here, you've got the barmaid. And the barmaid is serving these two slightly bolshy customers. And she's saying, Qui wall, sumat. Whoever ordered it, take it. Uh, no, it's mine, he says. No, mayor est. <laughs> this pair, uh, uh, probably a different pair, are having a game of dice, uh, and it's the end of the game, and he's saying, Exy, I've won. He says, no, you didn't get a three, no tria, you got a two. So it means you hadn't won. <laughs> and the final bit, uh, the picture's mostly been uh, lost, but you can see what's going on from the, from the writing that you, that's still above their heads. And this one's saying, um, you scumbag, you know, I did get a three, I won. And this one's saying, come on, fellator. And I'm afraid you can only translate it as, come on, you cocksucker, it was me. And in here must have been the, uh, the poor old landlord, the long-suffering landlord. And what he's saying is what every landlord has always said in history, you want a fight, mate? Get out. <laughs> Language just as rich as it is today, Mary. Excellent. Absolutely. Now, let's go and have a look at uh, how people ate and sat and drank when they were at home. Because the toffs were the not toff. arguing about dice. Right. <laughs> Before we come to the, how they were enjoying themselves in the evening, look at this extraordinary metalwork here. Yes. Whatever is that thing in the corner? Well, it's pretty kitsch, whatever it is, is a fantastically over-the-top lamp stand. Each of the things hanging from it are uh, double-header oil lamps. Isn't it gorgeous? That's what I go for. Now, we come now to this pièce de résistance, this picture here of how they used to wine and dine. Tell us about that. Well, this is great because it's, uh, it's a picture of the toffs at play, really, in the evening. And it's, it's also great because it's got the slaves pictured in, uh, which isn't always common. And... <laughs> The thing you notice first is that the slaves are all little. If this chap, if he's a fully grown man here, is he supposed to be? Well, he might be. But he's represented as a, as a half height. We can't he's tell whether some of them might be kids, but always they're represented smaller. And there's little slave taking the guy's shoes off. And he's obviously just arrived at the party because this one, while the shoes are coming off under there, this one is handing him uh, a silver goblet. And just like the silver, one of the silver goblets in the show, actually. So he's about to get going. Uh, this one, a guy here has got another different sort of goblet in his hand and someone's scratched over his head, Bebo. 
I'm having a drink, right? <laughs> <laughs> but my favourite bit of this um, is the indication that this party has already been going on for some quite a long time, because here is a guy who is actually falling over and it looks as if he's um, actually puking <laughs> up. Um, but what I think is funny about this is that, you know, one way this is completely different from the, the, you know, the poor guys we've been looking at in the bar, but <laughs> It's not quite as different as it might seem. And there's a, an, another nice set of paintings um, in, a, in another house, which has got scenes like this, but with little maxims written over them. And one of the maxims is, just like in the bar, if you want to quarrel, go home. And the other is, um, keep your eyes off somebody else's wife. It's a wonderful picture. It says so much, doesn't it? Let's move on now to what people might, what mischief people might have been up to after they'd left the party. Oh, I dread to think. curriculum, the bedroom. A very handy little space where you could sleep, obviously, but you could also, in fact, do other things. You could have business meetings or you could have private conversations with members of your household. Now, because this is the bedroom, this might be where you'd expect to find, how shall I put it, the slightly fruitier aspects of Roman culture to be displayed. Something like this, for example, which is a really lovely, sensuous, erotic fresco. I mean, just look at her, look at her lovely curved buttocks and that teasing little hand. But actually, this wasn't found in a bedroom. This was found in the colonnade of a garden belonging to a banker. So, thank goodness, Mary is here <laughs> to help me decode this little wonder. What, what do you think is going on here? Well, I think this is quite a puzzling image, actually, because in some ways it's frightfully coy. It's just hand to hand. Um, and one of the strange things is, is this, this female figure in the background. And, you know, what's she doing? Yeah. Well, that's, uh, well Look, one of the ways you can explain her is to say, look, she's a slave. And one of the things about ancient slavery is that slaves are unnoticed. Mm -hmm. So you can do anything in front of a slave, you can make love, you don't even notice them. They're kind of doing the dusting and... Who cares? Who cares? Who cares? I mean, other people would be a bit more raunchy than that, I guess, and they'd say, hmm... Yeah, she's about to join in, isn't she? Yeah. Um, she just looks slightly poised, actually, yeah, so she's just, yeah. ready and, to get into that bed. And, and one of the things that, that, that slaves, both male and female, were for in the ancient world were for being sex workers for their owners. Mm. So the idea that she was next in bed is not inconceivable. But, I mean, I suppose when I look at this, I think... We have to be very careful about taking this as a literal image of how sex happened mm -hmm. in the ancient world. I mean, actually, most of these images are probably the images of a fantasy version of sex. And so I look at this and I think, actually, here we've got a bit of voyeurism built into the painting, that this is quite a nice sub-pornographic erotic version of sex with a voyeur. And, mm. you know, be a bit careful before you say, oh, here's the slave about to leap into bed. She's looking. She's the viewer. So it's titillating and promising rather than pure raunch. Well, that'd be my guess. How I'm being generous. I'm being generous. You are, you are. Just tell me, though, how you explain a banker chose to put this in his garden. I mean, what, does that, what does that say to you? Yeah. Not about bankers. Anyway, but about, it says a lot about bankers. <laughs> Modern and ancient, no doubt. <laughs> but also, you know, it, it's about Romans in general. What, why were they so unabashed, in a way, about showing these images of well, sex? I think what you have to say is that, that Romans weren't unabashed in, 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 across the board but they had 
a different idea of where you could see sex going on and genitals. You know, we are, we are very kind of keen to, you know, put sex and genitalia into the bedroom, into kind of off limits, into adults only. Now, one of the things that you find in the ancient world is that images of sex, images of coupling, uh, images of male genitalia are sort of everywhere. I guess the thing about this is that the Romans would think that it's us that's weird, that, that we have restricted images of sex to kind of the bedroom and, and to erotic zones, because for them, images of sex could be almost anywhere. I, I tell you, what there certainly were, pretty much everywhere in Pompeii and Herculaneum, were phalluses. I mean, they're all over. And there's a fantastic... You've got to come up. There's a very funny one out here. Bethany. <laughs> <laughs> because the thing is, like it or not, there are a lot of erect male members <laughs> in these places. So, I mean, tell me, what, what do you think is going on with all those phalluses? Well, that's a big question that no-one's ever quite been able to answer. I mean, you could say, well, there's a lot of oversex men around here. You could say, ah, oh, it's really all about magic. It's about the willy as a protection against the evil eye. I kind of think it's about an aggressive assertion of masculinity. I mean, you know, the power in this world is about men. Mm -hmm. And you see the male member over the bread oven, on the pavement, in your face. It's about blokes. It's the ultimate form of willy waving. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I've got a question, Mary. Do you think the women of these cities, I mean, were they sick of this? Did you think they thought, not another phallus, please? Yes, they must away. Oh, put the willy away, put the willy away. I mean, they must have done, mustn't they? You think? Here we are, here's oh. our little friend. Yeah, well, this is really extraordinary. What it is, is a, an ancient equivalent of a wind chime. You can see all the little bells, they tinkle away in the wind. And you have to look a couple of times before you see that what it is from which the bells hang off is a phallus with wings and a phallus tail and another phallus underneath. And, you know, I think, how do you explain that? Do you say, this, at last, is someone having a joke about this phallic culture? Or are they saying, I want an awful lot of luck to come into my house and that's why you've got kind of phalluses to the power of X. With bells on. With bells on, why not? With <laughs> bells on. I mean, in a way, this one's cute, but I think we ought to look at something oh, more hardcore. This is hardcore, and actually I should just warn you um, that, that it's pretty shocking, so it might be worth you taking a quick peek just to check that you are OK um, with looking at it, because, I mean, it is... I've seen this lots of times, Mary, and I have to say it still leaves me feeling a bit uncomfortable. Well, look, it's, it's the god Pan making love to a goat, and I think it is unsettling. I mean, if anybody says, oh, I can look at this, no problem, I think, actually, they're kidding themselves. Mm. But... <laughs> In the Roman context, I think it might be a bit, might be a bit different, a bit more complicated. I mean, one of the ways I think I see this in Roman terms is as a kind of joke. I mean, you say, all right, so if we think Pan is the most hypersexualized person being in the world, how does he make love to a goat? And We've seen, we see here the sculptors kind of put them in a missionary position and Pan is all kind of quite cutesy and he's sort of going mmm, 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 and he's, he's sort of tugging on the little goatee's beard and, you know, it, in one way it looks all the world like consensual sex. Mm. Uh, the other way of seeing it, I suppose, is to say, well, look, Pan, he's not really even a human god. Pan's already half goat. He's mm. half man, half goat. You can see his little goaty legs. So this is not man makes love to goat. This is half goat makes love to goat. But, but, but why was it made? I mean, who would commission well, a piece of art yeah. like this? This is extremely rare. I mean, don't anyone get to think that these things are ten a penny. And in, in some ways, the context of this is very interesting because it was found in uh, the villa of the papyri, just outside Herculaneum. And one thing we know about that, it had a library full of Epicurean philosophical tracts. Now, Epicurean philosophy was half about the question of what pleasure is. You know, and I think putting this kind of sculpture in the middle of a villa whose owner is dead keen on the question of pleasure, you know, 
there's something which those two go together. And that, I mean, that's so important, isn't it? Because it reminds you, with any object like this, you should never just look at it uh, in isolation. You shouldn't take it on face value. You've always got to think about the archaeology in the context of where it was found and, and the history yeah. that was going on that's around right. it. Where was it? I mean, this wasn't in a public park. No, no. <laughs> it is extraordinary, though. I can turn my back on it. I've had enough of it. I've had enough <laughs> of pan and goat sex. So, I mean, the thing is, you've got to think that that night, whatever you were doing, whether you were philosophising or imagining erotic acts or dining with friends or maybe just sleeping, for the people in those two cities, this was your last night on Earth. In the morning, as they awoke, the people of Pompeii and Herculaneum would have had no idea the mountain that had looked over them all their lives was about to become a deadly monster. It was known that Vesuvius was a volcano, but it was presumed to be no longer active. Around 16 or 17 years before Vesuvius erupted, an earthquake caused considerable damage to Herculaneum and Pompeii. A marble relief shows the Temple of Jupiter and the Forum at Pompeii swaying wildly. There had been earth tremors and changes in sea level, caused, we now know, by volcanic activity. But the Romans didn't recognize these as signs of an impending eruption. So when tremors shook the cities on their final day, Many would have thought it another shake, little knowing that by the middle of that day, their lives would be plunged into darkness and chaos. So you have to imagine it's the morning and the well-to-do women of the city are starting their day as normal without any notion of what lies ahead. Um, now, we're told that they did their toilette in a very strict order. They started with their hair, then their makeup, then their jewellery, and then their clothes. And so this lady in this rather beautiful fresco is obviously at the first stage. Uh, I have to say, I think this is a bit of a fantasy version, because if she was a woman of any standing, then there'd have been a slave there to help her. Um, in fact, a rather special slave called an ornatrix, who was there to dress her hair in the very latest fashions and that was something that could take up to an hour. Now in the ancient world it's often very difficult to feel close to people in their intimate personal spaces but actually some extraordinary artifacts have survived from the cubiculum. Now, I have to say that this is one of my very favourite objects in the whole exhibition, and this is the man we have to thank for bringing it here, Paul Roberts, the curator. Kudos to you. What an extraordinary event <laughs> thank this you, is. Thank you, Thank you. As is this piece. I mean, it is remarkable, isn't it? It's an astonishing piece. Uh, the Romans, like us, in their bedrooms, needed somewhere to put their clothes, so here's a Roman linen chest. Um, was there any linen left inside? There was. When the archaeologists broke it open accidentally when they discovered it, uh, there were carbonised clothes inside. But because the whole thing is made of charcoal, isn't it? It is. The whole thing is charcoal. Wood carbonised into charcoal by the heat of the eruption. I tell you why I think it's so moving, because it sort of represents the order of these little cities and then the terrible chaos that, that, that actually, ironically, preserved this. I think that's exactly right. It's part of the routine of daily life. You have your clothes, you take your clothes in or put them back in, take them out for your daily wearing. It, it's a, a normal, everyday thing to do. And as an archaeologist, I imagine this is probably pretty much oh. as fragile as anything gets. This is the most fragile arche archaeological artefact you could ever imagine. Yeah. Um, a huge piece of charcoal. Yeah, well, yeah. well done for getting it <laughs> in here in one piece. And it is a once-in-a-lifetime chance to see this. So it is. I mean, thank you, because it's just beautiful in its in its own special charcoal-y <laughs> way. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I mean, obviously, metal's much more resilient. Mm. So did you get lovely jewellery preserved? Oh, some beautiful jewellery. Let's go and have a look at some. Oh, lovely. Oh, how beautiful. Yes, these, these are some of the pieces from our collections in the British Museum that look very similar to some of the pieces in the uh, exhibition. I tell you what's genuinely moving about this and being so close to it as well is 
these aren't just artefacts, they're not just objects. These are, are, are one woman's personal possessions. That's right. She bought them, looked at them, handled them, used them every day. Beautiful. I like the earrings. They're gorgeous. They're aren't gorgeous, they? quite kind of chunky on the bit H's, those. <laughs> they look very good on you. Oh, good. No, yeah, I won't try them. I won't no, try them no. <laughs> but can, can I touch anything? Yes, absolutely. Um, why don't you hold this rather beautiful bracelet? Wow. Oh, my heart's beating faster. It's, it's heavy, isn't it, this? Yes, yes. It's gold with emeralds and pearls. So that's interesting. So these are exotic gemstones that are coming in here to be used. Very much. The, the emeralds are coming all the way from India. The pearls probably coming from the Indian Ocean. It gives you a real sense of how connected these people are, that it's Absolutely. not just a kind of insular, parochial little place, that, that no. they've got a sense of a wider world. They're part of the Roman Empire that has access to all of this. Yeah. And also, just holding this, it really makes me think that this is, this is a kind of, you know, it's an aspirational society. It's a society that's got a sense of itself and, it, you know, it's it going is, somewhere. It is going somewhere and it's not just the rich. Um, poorer women might not have emeralds, but they'd have glass paste. They wouldn't have pearls, but they'd have white glass and bronze instead of gold. But they still wanted nice things. Kind of trying to keep up with the Joneses Absolutely. next door. Absolutely. And what, you can tell me something, that in all mm. the sources, in the literary sources, the poems and the plays, you hear, I have to say, these have all been written by men. Oh, yes, <laughs> so I don't of know course, if there's a bit yes. of poetic licence here. <laughs> but you man's kind of, view. in man's view of a woman, how a woman gets ready in the morning, but you hear about these incredible lotions and you potions do. and, you know, you uh, kind of objects that they use. Well, and, and in fact, we've got some proof here that all these different lotions and potions existed. We've got uh, a, a little cosmetic box there with a little individual compartments you could lift up and there'd be different pigments in there to do your makeup. And here there's a, a little ointment pot. This one is decorated with cupids. Oh, uh, yes. And this would have had a little lid and inside you would have had a cream, an ointment. And some of the creams were pretty bizarre. There was one called Dropax. <laughs> Drop I mean, it sounds bizarre, doesn't it? Drop Axe was actually made of, of resin and pitch, oh. and it was a depilatory. So it took the excess hair off your face, off your legs, and off your private parts as well. <laughs> it's a kind of Roman Brazilian Absolutely. going on. God, Drop Axe, we should market it now. Definitely. The Roman way. Take out a patent. <laughs> <laughs> bit, and, 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 what, and they were using resin, but sort of kind of odd things as well? Yes, yeah, there, there were all sorts of things. Um, swan fat and goose fat. Goose fat was good for pimples. Right. Um, swan fat was generally good for the skin. So you'd have all these weird concoctions. seem weird to us, but of course to the Romans they seem normal. But it, it wasn't all weird. Um, they loved perfume. Yeah. And in fact, here we've got a, a beautiful perfume bottle. Oh, that is beautiful. In lovely clear glass. And that would have contained perfumes made of uh, roses, lavender, even bergamot, cinnamon, things like that. The Romans loved their fragrances just as we do today. So, you, so you're a, a well-to-do woman and you've spent two or three hours getting yourself mm -hmm. ready definitely, in the morning. Definitely. What, what do you think you would have smelt like? I mean, would you be quite gorgeous or would it all be a bit rank with that <laughs> swan's fat <laughs> going think, on? Well, I think it wouldn't exactly have been a subtle scent. Right. I think it would have been quite a robust perfume that they would have liked. And, uh, and of course, we, we have to consider other elements of hygiene. I mean, our, our, our lady, uh, as the gentleman in the house, would have used their potty right. in the morning. First thing, you attend to nature's You attend needs. to nature's call, absolutely. <laughs> Um, and then you would have had a wash. Um, perhaps not everyone washed every day, and there were no en suites, of course. Mm. So what you use are your bowl and pourer sets. And in fact, we've got a pourer there, which has a lovely crinkled front. And when you poured the water out, it would have been a little like a shower. Beautiful. And actually, we still use things that look a bit like scallop shells in our bathrooms today, don't Absolutely. we? So, we do. you know, plus ça change. Yes. I feel sorry for the, for the slave, though, whose job it was to enter, uh, empty that chamber I pot. Do, well, absolutely, and emptying the pots would have been only one of dozens of things 
in just the bedroom that the slaves would have done. Yeah. And I think this presence of slaves is something that we can't underestimate. No. They were the motor of the house. Really. Absolutely, yeah. You, yeah. Have, you have to get your head around that, don't you? That's they're, right. they're always there, Definitely. you know, doing the very dirty jobs. <laughs> the very dirty jobs, absolutely. <laughs> so you've got this real kind of melange of scents, haven't you, as you start mm. in the morning. Mm. Um, but I have to say, even though some of them would have been quite disgusting, I think, there's this kind of olfactory window of relief. It's, it's the golden hour, the hour of baking. In Pompeii and Herculaneum, the largest and most imposing houses would have shops built into their exterior walls. Toffs and trade coexisted. They were, in fact, sometimes one and the same thing. Slaves were often supported by their owners in setting up a business that would then profit both. There were around 30 bakeries in Pompeii, so the smell of freshly baked bread would have perfumed the early morning streets before the horses and carts brought their own special aroma. The ovens would have been shared between households. 2,000 years ago, one slave in Herculaneum picked up his cooked loaf from the bakery for his master and mistress to eat. No one got to touch it. The slave, his owners and the bread were all flash burned, carbonized in the volcanic surge that killed the city. Now, this is, I think, a miracle. Here is a most familiar sight, a loaf of bread, black carbonized bread, and it's absolutely fascinating. 2,000 years ago, this is a loaf of bread. Looks much the same today, except it's black. And we got here a stamp on the side of the loaf there, which says Keller. And that, we think, is a, is a slave stamp. Stamped on there. Keller, by the way, means quick in, in Latin, which rather suggests maybe he was nicknamed Keller because he's pretty nifty at getting the bread out of the oven or something. Anyway, there's the loaf of bread carbonized. So huge was the surge of heat in Herculaneum and the complete absence of oxygen when this great surge came down that these things actually turned immediately to carbon. And they were, they were preserved for us in exactly that form. Now, I'm going to bring in Giorgio Locatelli. Giorgio. Giorgio is an Italian chef, and Giorgio has been, he's got it right with him, he's been reading all the Roman authors who wrote about food in Roman times. Giorgio, what do you make of this extraordinary relic here? Well, it was definitely the most exciting piece that I see in the exhibition because it was just it brought me right there in that moment when it happens. You know, it's bread, it's something that everybody uses every day. Italians have got a great love affair with bread and still enduring now. And you know, this piece of bread with these eight different slices that you can actually sort of break down. Yes, like that. portions, each person gets a exactly. portion. Exactly, they just break them down like that. It's, it's just so incredible uh, after uh, 2,000 years. How do you explain the other sort of ridge around the outside of the bread? You've been cooking a loaf for us, haven't you? That's right, I cook now, a loaf. You've made it as similar as you can, as similar as you can. And I try to, you know, give him a shape. I can only explain you know, I can only think that there is a string running all the way around. String. Which would Yes, a piece of string, which would allow you, you... You must think that the bread was used as a spoon as well to pick up the thing. So here you are. You, if you have it divided by the string, you have two pieces that comes together on the eighth, OK? Yes. And also, I think the most important thing is when you bought it, you picked it up no. and you take it away with you. So, <laughs> now, on, the, on your loaf, yes. just as on our loaf from Herculaneum, right, yeah. you've got the stamp here. Now, yeah. how do you explain that? I guess the stamps was during the day, the baker would bake for sale, and then in the afternoon, he would do another baking, which is happening it's still in Italy now. We'll do a baking for the people who prepare their own dough and brings it in just to be baked in the big oven. And so the, the, they wouldn't leave a stamp, so you know, in, in Lentini, in Sicily, still now, the people go in the afternoon, get their own bread baked, and they put a penny or something like that in it. So they recognize Look, their own law. So you think this tradition could have lasted 2,000 years? Yeah, definitely, is that possible? definitely, I guess it's the same thing. You say there's a place in Sicily where they put a stamp on to, 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 to mark their own loaves. That's right. So then they recognize it after it's baked. Yeah. Extraordinary. Now, Georgia, we've got some more uh, carbonized things That's over right, here, yeah, carbonized yeah. food. Yeah. What have we got? I mean, we've got some unbelievable, like, pomegranates. You see how beautiful yes. and small. And then you have the, the what 
what Roman cooking was all about. You have the figs, the almonds, you have the grapes, you have the uh, little bits of breads. So th this is all like ingredients and were sort of, again, carbonized because they were kept in those little jars. Little jars, little wooden ba of, they're wooden baskets, aren't they? That's right. They were and they're, they've carbonized as well. Unbelievably, they survived. And with, with the thing inside, they're also inside the jar, the glass jar that would have rested. You know, like it was, you must, there was no sugar at this time. There was no, you know, it's a different yeah. Italian cuisine than the one that we <laughs> figure out Tell now. You. And you know, so the sweetness of things, uh, like the dessert would have been, you know, your walnuts and, and your figs at the end of right. the meal. Right, now I want you to come round here, Giorgio, and yeah. look at this wonderful jar here. <laughs> yeah. now, this is the dormouse jar. That's right. In this jar, and it had a lid, of course, mm -hmm. you put dormice, yeah. and they would sort of fatten themselves up and run and scamper around the edges exactly. there, and eat out of those little troughs. Right. And they would be eaten, yes? Absolutely, you know, you'll have a... Dormice. Yeah, you have a, like, a, like a lids on there, because they were ferocious, they would attack you, and if you would have drop inside there, in those little two spaces, you would have dropped the food that you want them to eat. So if you feed them very well, after a time, you just get them and you open them up. Even Apicius talks about... A Apicius recipe. is the Roman writer about food. Uh, yes, exactly, and he talks about this sort of recipe with the dormice, and he talks about, you know, the, kill the dormice, skin it, and then fill it with force meat. And then, you know, you just uh, pound together pepper, pine nuts, liquamen and laser, and then you saw it back together and put it in the oven and cook it. What does it taste like? I think it would be fantastic. So like kind of a rabbit or something like that, like a sweet white meat. So, Charming, yeah. thank you very much. Not for me, thank you very much. <laughs> Look, uh, why don't you come over here, George? We've got here some kitchen implements, utensils. Right, yeah. What have we got here? Well, I mean, you've got different type of mold, you know, they have beautiful sort of like a rabbit one, but the most, uh, you have this one, then, you know, the, obviously the oven Poached where, eggs in that one, all right, perhaps? Uh, I don't think they were poached eggs, they were like baking, I guess. Those things okay. were like baking to baking fish or things like that. But the most incredible one is, is this calendar here, it is incredible. Look at the fire work of that. It's incredible how we don't make calendar like that. <laughs> it's a beautiful calendar, isn't it? I mean, look at the beautiful patterned holes, or tiny That's little right. holes all the way around. That's right. And You're it's quite so right. It's fine lovely. and beautiful. Just before we leave the kitchen, thank you very much, Georgia. Before we leave the kitchen, I want to show you this um, shrine here to the gods. It was usually near the kitchen or in the kitchen. And here you have a kind of uh, a surface on which they offered uh, offerings to the gods, a couple of snakes there, very auspicious things, snakes in those days. And right in the kitchen here, we've seen many houses, there would have been a drain right by where they actually served the food or cooked the food. And down that drain would go everything you can dream of, not just kitchen waste, but um, human waste as well. The, the contents of the family, chamber pots, for example, horrible. And the smell must have been horrible and terribly unhygienic. And talking of drains, I went to Herculaneum seven years ago to make a television program, and I remember meeting a team of people who are working in the drain at Herculaneum, digging out sewage and stuff to look inside it. And one of the key figures, the head of the team there, was Andrew Wallace Hadrill, who's with us here at the exhibition tonight. Now, Andrew, what an unpleasant thing to be doing. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, I know you're a bit squeamish about Roman lavatory practices, yes. but let me reassure you, the Romans were squeamish about it too. Here's this wonderful bit of fresco where someone's painted up on the wall a chap of... Uh, a little chap relieving himself, and above it are the glorious words, cacato cavi malum. Crapper, beware, you're in trouble. So <laughs> go and crap somewhere else. What did you find in the sewer? What were you after? So the, the, the Herculaneum sewer is an absolute joy. There's nothing like it. You've got an 80 meter run, and it's a triumph, so to speak, of Roman hygienic <laughs> engineering. They've connected up a couple of dozen shops and flats, all to the same great sewer. So you've got the largest amount of sewage <laughs> ever excavated in the Roman world. And what do you do with the sewage? Well, there's all sorts of stuff in it, and they're two different types, and one is the human waste. And that's fantastic, and I wish we could show it here in the exhibition, but you need a microscope to, to look at the stuff. But if you, if you sieve through the stuff and analyse it, you find the entire story of their diet. Fascinating. And, and, and what's so important about it is that this isn't the diet of the rich and famous. It's the diet of people living in shops and rented accommodation and so on. So they're quite ordinary Romans. And you've got an enormous richness of food there. 
all sorts of animal bones, fish bones. You've got over 50 different varieties of fish and shellfish, and then fruit and nuts, um, uh, even herbs to, to flavour the food with. Uh, so uh, the, the, the idea that the, the less well-off Romans just ate very boring food is absolutely wrong. And a lot of the stuff that you found in the drain is right here in this case. Well, this is just a small selection. Luckily, the Romans were quite incredibly careless, and we found something like 200 crates full of solid stuff that they'd thrown down their drains. What sort of stuff we got here? Well, it, it, at the back there, you've got what you could call the bog-standard stuff. <laughs> you, you've got the sort of cook cooking wares and, and cheap pottery. But what fascinates me is you've got some really rather pricey stuff here. You see this, this, this red stuff? Uh, that's Aratine ware. And it, it was a really upmarket kind of, of pottery. This one's got rather beautiful figures on it. And then, do you see that one there in front of the amphora? That comes from South Gaul. And it was only manufactured they only started manufacturing that sort of pottery a few years before the eruption. And already they're importing it from South Gaul to Pompeii. It was a new fashion. And then what have we got here? We've got, we've got loads of lamps. Um, you've got to imagine all their houses. Olive oil would have made them flame. Olive oil making them flame, exactly. Little wicks in the end. And the, like the, all the lamps of this period, they tend to have scenes on them. And you see there's one at the back there which has got a little scene of gladiators. That's one of the popular scenes. It's, and it is almost intact as a lamp. It's, why on earth did they throw that one away? Surely they could get a bit of light well, out I like of your it. thought about the slaves breaking up the kitchen yes. and, and saying, oh, hell, and chuck it down <laughs> the drain, hoping think, the owner wouldn't see it. But slaves are a, a notoriously dreadful, <laughs> careless lot. This is why the owner has to flog them so often. And don't you dare throw my favourite lamp you down. You might even get the old owner who thought his wife had picked up some <laughs> awful pot chucking that down the drain. Well, that, that's... Or vice versa. Th absolutely. And what are the women chucking down? Uh, uh, over here, you've got some, some needles um, for, for, for sewing and a, and, a, and a comb. It's lost all its teeth, but that's, that's probably because it was down the drain and the teeth were eaten away. And, and you've got a little bead there that could be from a necklace. And over here, th this is really astonishing stuff. You've got gemstones. Th these are really quite precious things to put in, in your signet ring. Um, and, and right in the middle there, you've got a golden ring with a gemstone but in how it. how on earth I get down the drain? How indeed. C can you imagine how the person who lost it cursed? What did I do? I, I, did, I, did I take it off while I was washing my hands or something? I can't find my ring. And no. it, down in the drain. What about these little glass tubes? Rather beautiful little glass tubes. The, those, those, are, those are for perfume. Uh, perfume ointment sort of things. Um, you, you could use it uh, when you went to the baths, for instance. You, you, you oil yourself down. Um, or just, uh, they could be for, for women um, to... to, to perfume themselves. And then you've got all sorts of bits of glass. And again, that glass is really quite fancy stuff. Uh, these are ordinary people. I can't say it often enough. These are not the grand people in the grand houses, but they're using really rather beautiful Was glass. Was glass very common and cheap in Roman times? Obviously. <laughs> we, we, we actually don't know the, the exact prices, but um, pottery like that was much commoner. That's the everyday stuff. That's the fancy stuff. So they're losing the fancy stuff as well as the cheap stuff. Now, Andrew, one of the most fascinating is this funny little statue, a very pretty little, rather moving little statue here, of what looks almost like a Madonna with a child in her lap. What on earth is that? Isn't she lovely? It's a little terracotta statuette. And initially you think it's a Madonna suckling, but uh, actually she's got the baby on her knee. Yes. Um, uh, 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 and, of course, you want to know, is that, is that a Christian thing? Um, and I think the answer is it, it, it's very unlikely to be Christian. It could be, of course, because, because there were pagan images. Well inside the Christian era. There were pagan images. The suckling mother, the mother who looks after the child, is, is uh, not just a Christian image, but a universal human image. But once again, why is it down the drain? <laughs> what indeed is it doing down there? Uh, 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 did someone carefully put it by their latrine as a sort of 
a, a protective go goddess and she fell down in, in an earthquake or something. We have no idea how this stuff got down there. All I can say is it's, it's pretty amazing stuff. Now, you're, you're very much an expert on Herculaneum. Why is Herculaneum so much lower profile than Pompeii? Ah, Herculaneum's the little one. Pompeii's the big site. Herculaneum's the little site. But even more important than that, Herculaneum has always been much harder to dig because it's covered in this deep cover of what's effectively rock. And underneath a modern town. And underneath a modern town. So it's always been a big struggle to excavate there. And it, it's actually the publicity me machine, first of the Spanish kings who ruled in Naples, who discovered that Pompeii was the perfect thing to attract tourists. And that publicity machine has gone on and on and on. And the modern tourism is an extension of that 18th century stuff. Now, you, you, you know Pompeii, you know uh, Herculaneum Pompeii very well. There's so much of Pom the Herculaneum still unexcavated, and Pompeii too. Why not go ahead and do more excavation? Isn't it a dream? There's, what, two-thirds, three-quarters of Herculaneum three still of unexcavated. Extraordinary. And I completely understand people saying, let's, let's dig up some more. And sometimes I get a bit unpopular because I say, slow down. First, let's look after what we've already dug up. Because the problem is, both these sites, currently, right as we speak, are falling to pieces. And in that process of looking after them properly, you can find out so much more. We found this stuff in the sewer of Herculaneum because we were examining in greater detail what's already been excavated. And there's a lot of more of that still to do before we need to open up vast new areas of excavation. Is there a bit of a debate going on about this? I mean, are you on one side of the argument, the others on the other? Do some people want to go ahead and dash away and excavate? On the whole, archaeologists are on my side. The people who want the treasures out say, come on, let's excavate. Mm. But excavation is such a slow and difficult process, you know. It only took us a few months to excavate this material. To study it has taken us, we're still studying it today, years later. It just takes so long to understand things properly. And what I want people to do is to slow down and really look at it in depth and in detail. OK, thank you, Andrew. Well, now, let's um, move on from all this talk about drains and uh, smelly rooms like the kitchen and the toilet and so on to this fantastically spick and span atrium right in the centre of the house, the vestibule. And, and uh, Paul, this is really designed to impress, isn't it? Yes, it, it certainly is. If you've got the money to have a lovely house like this, then you've got a lot of political and economic dependence and, and you'll invite them into your house and they'll ask you for political favours, for loans, and you wow them. You want to impress them with your status, your wealth, your ancestry, your devotion to the gods. And so you fill the atrium with things that reflect this. Um, the ancestors are present, but also current members of the household. One of the loveliest paintings in the exhibition is a painting of a baker called Terentius Neo and his wife. What's his wife name? Oh, we don't know. Mrs. Baker. Mrs. Baker. <laughs> and so there they are, good Romans in their Sunday best, and it's what they're holding that's most interesting because they are literate, they are cultured. He's holding a scroll, which could be a, a speech, could be a piece of Latin or, or Greek. Um, she, on the other hand, is holding wooden writing tablets. And these, we know, were used for holding the accounts. And so she's actually saying, look, I am doing the business end of things. So they're a partnership in marriage, but also they're a partnership in the business. Women did have a status, no question. They did, they did, absolutely. And then, of course, there's how you made that wealth. Now, wealth could come through inheritance. It could come through land, property rentals. But a lot of it came through business, through, through making things and trading things. And, in fact, there's a man in the west of Pompeii built a lovely big house on the proceeds of selling fish sauce. He sold the garum, the, the really exotic Roman fish sauce that was the basis of Roman cuisine, made of, of rotting fish. 
fermented. Uh, and he made enough money to build a nice house. And when they laid out the floor, he actually set into the floor four panels of mosaic in the shape of his lovely fish sauce bottles with the best fish sauce made of mackerel from the factory of Scourus. That was his name. Scourus. What did this stuff taste like, do you suppose? It actually tasted very nice. It sounds revolting, but it tasted very good. Sort of ketchup. Yes. In fact, one American coined his, his nickname was the Ketchup King of Campania. <laughs> this was Aulus's nickname. But uh, there were lots of ways of making wealth. Of course, you had to display that wealth. And the other thing you had to do in the atrium really was to show your devotion to the gods. The gods were everywhere in the Roman house, like they were in, in Roman society. And there's a particularly beautiful painting. Uh, there, there are different types of shrines that you could have in your home. You could make a, a shrine, a little model of a temple, or you could paint shrines on the walls. And there's a shrine uh, from an atrium in Pompeii, which shows Mount Vesuvius. And it's before the eruption, so it's nice and green, and there are vineyards down the bottom. And standing by the side is Bacchus, the god of wine and fertility. Because, of course, it was a very fertile area thanks to the volcano. Uh, a Greek writer, Strabo, actually says, Vesuvius used to be a live volcano spewing out fire, but now it's run out of fuel, and that's what makes the land so fertile. It's a volcanic, fertile area. Did the Romans take these gods seriously, these absurd characters like Bacchus? Well, it's interesting. We, we can't be sure whether they worshipped them, whether it was a religion as such, or whether it was a superstition, but all we do know is that every single inch of a Roman home has depictions of the gods, just like society. So whether they believed in them or not, they were so important to them. OK, Paul. Now, in our narrative of the hours leading up to the catastrophe, it's around late morning, so we're at the point just before Vesuvius erupts. But let's hold off for a moment, because Brett, Bethany and I want you to see the most beautiful space of this Roman home. This garden room here is from a place the excavators at Pompeii named the House of the Golden Bracelet. And originally, these fresco panels would have sat very snugly together, but the museum has opened them up so more visitors can enjoy them. So what you have to imagine here is an elegant three-tiered house behind this garden room, a view out over to the garden, and then beyond that, the sea. And here to experience the garden delight of me is the garden expert, Rachel de Tame. It absolutely absolutely is delightful. That's the only word for it when you come in here. And I think when you get that sense that this was a much smaller space, that it was really somewhere very special and you had to come right through the house, through the atrium, through the garden to this room at the very end, makes you feel that it was something that perhaps only to be enjoyed by, by a favoured few. It's exquisitely beautiful. There's no doubt about that. But is it real? Are these, are these real plants oh, that could have grown in the garden? Absolutely real, absolutely. I mean, that's the beauty of it, is that it's so finely painted that you can identify plants immediately. I mean, things like the Arbutus unado, they're the strawberry tree. You look at the fruits on that, it's exquisite. And you've got oleander, you've got a viburnum there, possibly viburnum tinus, possibly not. I think it might be a, a summer flowering type, a plane tree. Mm. there in the middle and we've got roses you've got all of that sort of up at the top you've got the trees and the shrubbery and then down below the perennials that sort of understory of planting things like marigolds and daisies and look there's ivy crawling that's a variegated ivy just mm. crawling through there I think it's exquisite and would these all have been growing together at the same time well I think it's certainly an idealized scene um, the things would have, most of these plants would have been flowering through the spring through into the summer so they do represent a fairly short space of time in terms of flowering um, and certainly I think the artist must have been asked to show this garden at its absolute peak you know the time that you'd want to sit here and admire these plants and, and get the fragrance the sense of these flowers mm. so I think in in those terms it is it's real and yet it's sort of hyper-real. It's, it's, it's been done in Technicolor. Yeah, the chrome dials kind yes. of ranked up a notch. Exactly. I mean, also, gardens had a job of work to do, because, I mean, the flowers here, they were never just put in vases in, in a home. They were used as garlands, weren't they? That's right. I mean, there's, there's certainly no evidence that they cut flowers and kept them in the home, but they did grow flowers specifically for ritual use. I mean, these garlands that are represented all the way along the top there are absolutely beautiful. 
Um, and I think certainly that a lot of these plants you would have grown for medicinal reasons, for mm. culinary purposes, for all sorts of other reasons. But perhaps in, in the garden here, in this courtyard, I doubt that you'd have been able to have, been able to have that many. Mm. And therefore, probably a lot of plants would have been grown outside the homes as well for mm. those purposes, to get the quantity that they needed. And what do you think, as a gardener, uh, is, is this kind of fantasy garden a good garden? Would, would it practically have worked? I think it would have worked. I think it would have been quite wild. I mean, there's definitely a sense of, of nature being here. and It's only just tamed. I mean, there's a lot going on here. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's well, that's really interesting because at, well, you've got these representations here, these kind of masks and these uh, pictures. They're all to do with Bacchus. And Bacchus, we think of him always as the god of wine, but of course he was also the god of nature. And I wonder if the Romans are saying something here. They're sort of saying, we have tamed nature, we've created a garden, but actually we need to keep the god of nature on side. Yes. You know, we never know when he might kick off. And so that's why you have some of these images which are quite sinister, some of them. I mean, those gaping masks, they're, yes, they're not they are, comfortable they? images. They're, they're definitely they? not comfortable, and I had wondered why they were there. Um, and I love that idea that although, I mean, there's this great sort of Roman urge to make everything very contained and controlled and so on, but yet you cannot control nature in every sense. No, that's why you've got all the birds. All, all the, birds the birds you can throw at a gardener here all at the same time. I've been time, trying to identify they? them. I mean, some are ob obvious, I think, things like magpie. We've got um, lots of doves as well. Mm, a golden um, oriole there. Oh, very well out. done. That's very good. What about yeah. this one? It's a very peculiar looking thing, almost a rather comic bird over it, there. It is, but this is brilliant because actually it's one of the curators here who has identified that correctly for the first time in English. And it is? And it is a purple swamp hen. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm very impressed. I'm very impressed that someone's managed to find that out. it was quite swampy, you see, around these cities. There's, there's another detail here that I absolutely love. There's a nightingale on top of that stake. And if you look closely, the rose, look at all the thorns going up the stem. Mm. The, the rose has actually been tied on. Now, I was doing that two days ago in my own garden. Mm. And here we are in Pompeii, just showing that representation, not only of the plants, but of the, the skill that, of gardening yes. and of, of growing these things. I think that's wonderful. So and I think that's um, um, an opium poppy, pop of the somniferum next to it as well, which would have been an important medicinal plant. Very too. important medicinal plants. And then also actually seeing all these, all these different species, some of these are ones that we're so used to in our modern countries, mm. and actually particularly that we think of as very British, you know, the rose, and we also think of things like apples and cherries and pears and lavender yes. as being British. Yes. But, but the rose Romans brought them but to not us. at all, exactly. I mean, the Romans were key in terms of introducing plants, you know, far and wide, not only to Britain, but right out across the world. I mean, a lot of that is a result directly of the plants that, uh, that the Romans introduced to us. So you're, you're right. I mean, this, you certainly couldn't have had this anywhere else at that time, no. this scene. So we have to imagine, I think, sitting here close on 2,000 years ago on one of the stone benches that they May had provided. Maybe with a glass of wine or two. Very definitely with a glass <laughs> of wine. Looking out over the garden and then beyond the sea. Mm. Perfection. Beautiful. During the morning of the last day, there were tremors and then short, sharp explosions as the top of Vesuvius burst open and a great mass of volcanic material mixed with gas and ash was thrown into the sky. At one o'clock in the afternoon, there was a dark column of cloud building up above the volcano. This was a Plinian eruption, named after the writer Pliny who witnessed the destruction. You could hear the shrieks of women, he wrote, the wailing of infants and the shouting of men. Many besought the aid of the gods, but still more imagined there were no gods left and that the universe was plunged into eternal darkness evermore. As the cloud rose, winds began to spread ash and other matter southwards. The people of Herculaneum were plunged into almost total darkness. To the southeast, Pompeii suffered a rain of pumice. This went on throughout the afternoon until a new kind of pumice, denser and heavier than before, shot up into the cloud. 
The cloud reached around 30 kilometers, around 20 miles high. But then it destabilized and collapsed several times, creating a series of fast-moving avalanches of superheated gas, ash, and pumice, known as pyroclastic surges. These surges hit the cities traveling at over 110 kilometers. That's 70 miles an hour. The population of Herculaneum, we think, died around midnight. Pompeii died at around 7 or 8 the next morning. None of the women, children, men, and animals who were actually in Pompeii and Herculaneum at the time survived. Now, Paul, we, we've got this picture of the two cities being hit at different times. Uh, did anyone escape? Yes, in the early phase of the eruption, people could get away by, by land, in Herculean in particular, by sea. But a lot of people didn't escape. Um, maybe they were ill, maybe they were old. They chose to stay in their homes where they thought they'd be safe. They stayed in their cities. And in Herculaneum, a lot of people went down to the beach. Um, about 350 bodies were found on the beach. And some of them maybe had got away by boat. Some of their relatives, friends had got away. They chose to stay. And at midnight, the great volcanic cloud collapses. And, and a pyroclastic surge, this avalanche of superheated material, 400 degrees centigrade, heads down towards Herculaneum. And it's traveling at about 70 miles or 110 kilometers per hour. And it pushes through the city. And as it goes through the city, everything that is made of wood, uh, staircases, ceilings, uh, the furniture in the houses is, is turned into charcoal. It's carbonized. It's so hot that it's actually turned into a charcoal. Uh, even the, the food, people? the people are desiccated. They're, they're shriveled, burnt down to the bone. And we know this because on the beach at Herculaneum, those bodies, the pyroclastic surge flows onto the beach, kills them immediately, and, and in effect reduces them down to skeletons. And these are the people that were trying to escape? They were trying to now, escape. Now, we have here, I mean, you have here, Paul, mm. um, and some amazing objects found with those people on the beach, don't we? That's right. Tell us about them. Well, they're a collection of objects that people picked up and ran with down to the beach. And as you can see there, there's a lantern. Now, why a lantern? The eruption starts at midday. Well, the reason is it's pitch black. The great cloud has blotted out the sun, so you're stumbling around in the darkness. You're trying to decide, do you run, do you stay in your house? But whatever you do, it's dark, so you need a lantern. And you can see there the key, because, of course, they thought they were going back to their homes. Extraordinary. Could there be the key to a safe or something? Or you said probably a house, front it door? The, it could be the key to a front door, a workshop, a little shed. It could be, uh, but it's the key for some place that meant something. And let's find, with a body on the beach, someone running away from their home they've locked up and hope to go back to. They hope to go it's back to and never did. Terrible. Okay. Now, what else have we got here, Paul? Well, there's a wooden money box there which only contained two coins. It might have belonged to a child, maybe. Let's move back to the other case here, this huge case here with lots of exciting things in it, Paul. What have we got here? Well, you've got a doctor who was on the beach with his medical instruments and even the carrying case that the scalpels and the probes were all put into. Uh, a little girl was on the beach with her charm bracelet and you can see there all the different charms from the Roman Empire and beyond. Uh, cowries from the Indian Ocean, there were uh, Baltic amber amulets. Do we, do we have a picture here of the doctor and the young girl picking these up as they left home, rushing off with their precious possessions? The things they thought to run with when, when they left their homes. Two fine gold bracelets here. Yes, a, a woman had these beautiful bracelets and uh, some jewellery, and she ran with that uh, and died with it on her. What else? Now, what's on here? Oh, that's a soldier. There was a soldier on the beach with a sword, a stabbing dagger, a gladius, and he had this wonderful ornamental belt. But he also had, perhaps surprising, on his back was a rucksack full of woodworking tools. And he ran away with all this stuff, thinking he might he need to use them all. That. Or the precious sword he wanted to take with him, just in case he never got back. But the sad thing was, of course, not the soldier, not the doctor, not the girl with the charm bracelets. None of this could save them, and they all die together on the beach. 
Now, Paul, we come next to the, I think, the most striking and evocative part of the exhibition, which is the, these extraordinary plaster casts mm. of people who died in Pompeii in the exact positions in which they died. How on earth did they make these? Well, the, Pompeii was destroyed by the same pyroclastic surges that, that hit Herculaneum, though later, at 8 o'clock in the morning. But by then, and by the time the surge hits Pompeii, uh, it's less hot. So it's only about 300 degrees. So it doesn't uh, burn the bodies down to the bone, as, as happened to many of the bodies in Herculaneum. Instead, if you like, the, uh, the bodies in Pompeii are cooked. Their, their flesh becomes solid. The ash swirls around them and then cases the body in fine ash, which, which takes the shape of the body. And as the body rots away, as it in inevitably does, um, left in the ash were the, 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 the shape of the body. When the archaeologists discover those bodies in the 19th century, they discover the holes, rather. It's um, a void, really, it, with it, the shape it, of the exactly body. Exactly that. It's a void with the bones inside. Um, and they very cleverly discovered that if you stop digging, pour in plaster of Paris, let it set, dig away the ash carefully, there is uh, a body of a real person, the shape of the body just as it died. And here we have this guy here. I mean, it's an extraordinarily emotional thing to want to look at, isn't it? I mean, he, this is a man dying it at the moment of death. In that position. Uh, and and he's in a sort of curious crouching position with his hand up to his face, is he? Is that what's going on? Yes, he's probably trying to mask his face, to cover his face from, from what he's seen is coming. He probably saw the great pyroclastic surge heading towards him, covered his face in those last moments. Now, a very poignant thing we see from Herculaneum is that little cradle, oh, yes. which again talks about people so effectively. What's that all about? Well, it's a, a cradle, as you say, made of wood. Yeah. But when you have that intensely hot surge over Herculaneum, 400 degrees, the wood is, in effect, turned into charcoal. So you have the real cradle, but turned into charcoal. And, of course, sadly, inside was discovered the little occupant of the cradle, a baby maybe nine months, a year old. And because it was Herculaneum, it was a skeleton. Full stop. Skeleton, absolutely. Um, and, of course, that cradle really does speak to us of, of family. Well, talking of family, let's move on to the last one. What, to me, I think has the greatest impact of all in, the, in this whole exhibition. And it's, it's the family, Paul, that's extraordinary, isn't it? Yes. Here we have a family, plaster casts of a family, and they're at the moment of death again. Just take us through it. You have a man, almost certainly the father, a on woman the left. On, on the left, the woman on the right, with the small child rising from her lap, and then another child laid out by the side. And the, 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 the child's features are so incredibly real, aren't they? They are. I mean, you can see the mouth, the nose, the eyes and the ears, and, and even the clothes on the child, and the, and the father as well. That's right. Uh, Pompeii, because it was buried by only 300 degrees, the bodies are cooked, then we could make the cast, but the clothing, uh, the facial features, sometimes even the hair, you can still see it. Now, why are they in this curious... I mean, obviously, they've been hit by this terrifying surge. Yes. But why the, the, the arms up like that? Well, it looks as if they're resisting the surge. It looks as if they're fighting. But actually, it's, it's a pose called the pugilist or the boxer pose. And it's what happens to the body when it's hit by this high temperature, this 300 degrees, that the tendons actually start contracting. So the arms and the legs sort of contract like this. So it looks like they're fighting against... As the surge hits them, what do you think they were doing at the time the surge hit them? Is this sitting down? They're under a staircase, aren't they? They were. They were found under the stairs uh, and they, they were sitting. The surge hits them. The, the, the so poignant thing is that the mother was obviously holding the child up until the last moment. Then she falls back. And the father also falls back like that. Yes. Uh, and and what, what, would they have known anything about it? No. They would have died very, very quickly. At those temperatures, your consciousness would shut down. You, your system might carry on working for some seconds, but you as a person are, are dead. It just reminds us, doesn't it, that this is <laughs> over and above everything. It's an intense human tragedy, isn't it? It is a terrible tragedy. Um, but the ironic thing is that the, the tragedy that 
gave us these awful images of, of death have preserved so many things to do with, with life. I mean, with these people, for example, we know that they were quite well off. They enjoyed a, a, a nice lifestyle. The um, woman in particular had with her a lot of jewellery, uh, coins, and this wonderful golden bracelet that you can see. Um, and that, of course, gave solid gold. Solid gold. What's over it weigh, half Robert? a kilo. You're joking. Half a kilo half a of kilo gold. Half a kilo of gold. Blimey. And she had it on her arm. And uh, in fact, it, it gave its house the, the name, the, the House of the Golden Bracelet. And of course, that name's familiar to us because it's the beautiful garden room from the House of the Golden Bracelet that Bethany and Rachel were, were talking in before. buried in one horrific 24-hour period 2,000 years ago. Now, lots of you have written to us online uh, in the past few weeks asking questions, many of which I hope we've answered in this live event. And we've now a few to ask to uh, Mary and Paul. Paul and Mary, are you ready for these? Yes. Mary, I think you can go first. Uh, this is from Vincent de Lorenzo, good Italian-sounding name, from Worcester. And he asks... What percentage of the population do you think escaped Pompeii? Well, I think we've got good news here, actually, because quite a big percentage, probably. I mean, we found, putting the two towns together, so far the remains of about 1,500 people. That would be, well, perhaps 10% of the population. So we know that some people tried to escape and didn't make it. There must have been others, particularly those who got their acts together earlier. Who did make it, do you think? Yeah, I'd agree. Uh, a lot of people probably got away. There were still some bodies to be discovered in the fields outside Pompeii, washed out to sea in Herculaneum, but uh, a lot of people would have got away. Yeah, Paul, a, a question for you from um, Bernie Muir in uh, London. What was the hardest decision to make in terms of deciding what not to include <laughs> in the current exhibition? The, the only hard decision I had to make was to choose between the enormous range of things. Our colleagues in Naples, Pompeii, Herculaneum were so generous and so helpful. The only problem I had was deciding which of these wonderful things I could bring. It's a good problem to have. Um, another one for you, Paul. I think this is from Anne Lindsay in mm. Swansea. And she says, thinking about the site itself, how can you ensure that there's no further deterioration to those existing frescoes in situ? Uh, well, the, the simple answer is you can't unless if you discover the fresco, cut it out from the wall, take it to the museum, then it's preserved. Or if you roof it over, it may survive as well. But if it's left exposed, then you can't protect it. So it's a bit of a choice between uh, removing or protecting or, or leaving exposed. Because there was a terrible thing, wasn't there, in, in the earliest excavations when on the podium of the amphitheatre there was a fresco exposed. That's right. And it just... In one night of heavy frost, yeah. all the frescoes just crumbled. Just crumbled. So that's the problems that, that we're facing. Now, yeah. now, one for both of you. This is from um, Brian Waring and Gospel. This relates to that issue I was discussing with Andrew wallace Hadrill earlier, whether or not to go on excavating. What do you think you should do? Excavate, Mary, or conserve? Well, there's quite a lot still to be excavated. Three quarters of Herculaneum, a third of Pompeii, and 
now we tend to think not excavation and that's that's partly because of a conservation issue we should actually look after what we've got not find more but there's also a sense that we've got to leave some of this for future generations who actually might be able to do more clever scientific things in squeezing it for information so leave it under the soil Mm, I, I agree. There, there's a lot being done regarding conservation, and that's the best thing to do, rather than dig up more, leave it for the future. But I still, I don't know, I still sometimes go to bed and I dream about excavating more of Pompeii, and I think, mm, that's what I'd love to do, but I, I shouldn't. No. So do I. <laughs> <laughs> I can't help which they dig up more. I know, but, so, but more but secrets to be revealed in the future. <laughs> exactly. That's, that's the thing. We must look after what we have. Yeah. <laughs> I'm afraid that's, that's it. We've got time for no more questions. Um, but the conversation can now continue on Facebook and, of course, on Twitter at hashtag Pompeii Live. Well, now it's time to leave you, but with a final word from Neil McGregor, the director of the British Museum. Uh, Neil, what would you like people to take away after this journey through this exhibition? I think the fact that the people of Pompeii and Herculaneum died in a particularly dreadful way. But that death allowed us to enter their lives, to think about what it was like to be a Roman, to live in the Roman Empire. That's what the whole exhibition has been about. It's what the whole museum is about. So, let you explore other people's lives and think the world differently. That's what's been so marvellous about making this exhibition available to everybody through this new way of broadcasting on cinema. And we hope that we're going to be able to do it again and let people all around the world visit the exhibitions at the British Museum. And we have so too. Well, thank you, Neil, and goodbye to you all. Goodbye. goodbye. <laughs>